They locked him in a cell during the bloodiest chapter of the French Revolution. They thought they'd buried a radical. But inside that cold prison, Joseph Fourier wasn't planning an escape. He was rewriting the science of heat. And what he discovered would set fire to the future of mathematics, physics, and even climate science. This is the untold story of Joseph Fourier, the prisoner who changed the world. Joseph Fourier was born in 1768, the son of a tailor in the small town of Auxerre, France. By age nine, he was an orphan, his mother and father both gone. He had no wealth, no title, no privilege, just an unusually sharp mind. While other children played, Fourier sat by candlelight, devouring whatever books he could find. He was sent to be educated by the Benedictine monks, originally intended for the priesthood. But behind the prayers and Latin verses, he found something else, mathematics. The monks recognized his gift. He could grasp abstract concepts faster than anyone in class. They gave him access to their private library and Fourier started to think beyond God and toward reason. By his late teens, Fourier was already solving problems many adults couldn't understand. He began corresponding with local scholars and was invited to lecture before he'd even finished training. But he was poor, and the priesthood still seemed his only practical path. Secretly, he longed for something different, a world where logic and numbers ruled. When the French Revolution broke out in 1789, Fourier was 21. He embraced it, not for violence, but for the promise of equality and knowledge. Enlightenment thinkers became his new saints. He believed the revolution could build a society ruled by reason, not royalty. Fourier joined the Revolutionary Committee in Auxerre. He became responsible for enforcing revolutionary law, including arrests and property seizures. It was dangerous, political and morally complex work. But to Fourier, it was the cost of building a better, more rational world. But in 1794, the revolution turned on its own. Fourier was arrested by radicals during the Reign of Terror. The prisons were full of revolutionaries who weren't revolutionary enough. He was thrown in a cold, crowded cell, accused without trial, his fate uncertain. Day after day, prisoners were called and didn't return. Fourier waited, not knowing if he would see morning. But even in terror, his mind kept working. In that freezing cell, he began to wonder, how exactly does heat move through a wall? Then, suddenly, it was over. Robespierre fell, and with him, the prisons opened. Fourier emerged, exhausted, changed, but alive and he carried something with him, a fire no prison could kill, the desire to understand the invisible laws that ruled the world. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte wasn't just launching an invasion, he was launching a vision. He summoned over 160 of France's brightest minds, engineers, artists, linguists, and one rising mathematician, Joseph Fourier. Napoleon believed that where his army marched, knowledge would follow, and Fourier was chosen to help lead that mission into the sands of Egypt. They arrived in a land like no other, the ancient empire of the pharaohs. Fourier, dressed in heavy European clothes, staggered through the heat. This was a place of mystery, of ruins, of centuries-old knowledge buried in stone. It was also a place where survival meant adaptation, fast. Fourier became secretary of the Institut d'Egypte, a new academy Napoleon ordered to be built. The mission, study, document and catalogue everything about Egypt 
its land, its people, its secrets. Fourier organized lectures, managed research, and took on roles far beyond mathematics. This wasn't just science, it was exploration, and Fourier was at its heart. Fourier explored tombs that hadn't been entered in thousands of years. He saw astronomical charts etched into stone, measured symmetry in temple designs. The ancients understood harmony, rhythm, ideas not unlike mathematics. Egypt whispered truths that even the Enlightenment had not yet caught. Fourier applied his skills to mapping the Nile, a lifeline carved through the desert. He calculated flood patterns, river gradients, and heat levels. His mind turned Egypt's chaos into order, symbols, and equations. He was no longer just a mathematician, he was becoming a scientist of the world. The Egyptian heat was brutal, and Fourier nearly died from sunstroke. But even in sickness, he wrote, he asked, how does heat travel through air, through stone, through skin? His struggle with survival fed his obsession with heat. This land didn't just test him, it transformed him. Fourier's letters home didn't speak of war or sandstorms. They spoke of ideas, of wave patterns in heat, of mathematical symmetry in Egyptian architecture. His mind burned brighter than ever, even as the expedition around him began to fall apart. To his friends in Paris, it was clear something profound was forming. By 1801, Napoleon's Egyptian dream was dead. The army was retreating, the scholars were leaving, but Fourier was ready. He didn't return as the man who had left. He returned as someone carrying the heat of the desert and the seed of an idea that would change science forever. In 1702, Napoleon gave Joseph Fourier a new title, Prefect of Isère. It wasn't a scientific role, it was political. He'd be managing a region, not equations. To many, it looked like the end of his mathematical career. But to Fourier, it was just the beginning of his greatest work. As prefect, he oversaw roads, canals, bridges, the lifelines of a growing France. Every day was full of decisions, disputes, deadlines. It was duty, but it wasn't passion. That passion came when the sun went down and the world went quiet. At night, he became someone else, a man possessed by numbers. He studied heat, how it moves, spreads, disappears. He asked, could a simple law explain this invisible force? And soon patterns began to form, rhythms in the chaos. He saw heat not as a blur, but a rhythm. Like music, it moved in waves, measurable, predictable. He broke complex patterns into simple curves, signs and cosines. It was a method no one had dared reduce reality to a mathematical melody. By 1820, Fourier had turned obsession into manuscript. The analytical theory of heat wasn't just a paper, it was a blueprint of nature. He showed that any flow of heat could be broken into parts and predicted. It was radical, elegant, and to some, deeply suspicious. The scientific elite didn't buy it. His use of infinite series questioned his logic. Called sloppy, Lagrange, Laplace, Poisson, the giants said Fourier had overreached. He hadn't just challenged the rules, he'd bent them. He refused to back down. If the method works, he said, then it is true enough. Even as criticism grew, he polished, corrected, clarified, but never surrendered. This wasn't ego. It was faith in a future no one else could see. In 1822, the book was finally published. It did not make headlines, but it began changing minds. One by one, scientists opened its pages and saw the future. Fourier's name had entered the great halls of science, though not without a fight. Einstein, 
After years in Grenoble and Egypt, Fourier returned to Paris. Napoleon was gone. The empire had collapsed. But Fourier's ambitions hadn't. He no longer chased power. He chased permanence. And in this new France, he'd find the stage he deserved. The Académie des Sciences welcomed him back, now not just as a mathematician, but as a respected thinker. He became its secretary, its speaker, and its soul. The man who once scribbled formulas in a prison cell now led France's greatest minds. The circle was closing and the world was listening. But Fourier wasn't done. In 1824, he proposed something no one had considered. What if Earth's atmosphere acted like glass, trapping heat? He showed how gases could hold warmth, raising temperatures. It was the first ever scientific description of what we now call the greenhouse effect. Scientists pushed back. The math was new. The concept, too bold. But Fourier held firm, answering each doubt with clarity, each insult with data. He wasn't fighting for fame. He was defending truth. Long after his death, his work echoed. Lord Kelvin expanded his heat theories. James Clerk Maxwell built his field equations with Fourier in mind. He was no longer just a name. He was a foundation. On May 16, 1830, Joseph Fourier died in Paris. The cause, heart disease, made worse by heat exhaustion, almost poetic. The man who studied heat was, in the end, undone by it. But he left behind more than a theory. He left behind a new way to see the world. He was buried at Père Lachaise, among Paris's greatest. But Fourier's tomb is different, crowned by an Egyptian obelisk, a tribute to the desert that shaped his mind and the heat that consumed his thoughts. Even in death, he stood apart, timeless, exact, symbolic. Today, his name is etched in metal on the Eiffel Tower, one of 72 honored scientists. His ideas live in every smartphone signal, MRI scan, and climate model. Joseph Fourier didn't just study heat, he shaped the way we understand the universe. From revolution to radiation, his legacy burns brighter than ever.